Hello and welcome to eBible Fellowship's Evening Bible Studies with your host and Bible teacher, Chris McCann. We invite you to our website at ebiblefellowship.org for additional Bible studies. And now with his study in the Book of Romans, here's Chris McCann. Good evening and welcome to eBible Fellowship's Bible study in the Book of Romans. Tonight is study number 25 of Romans chapter 2, and we're, we're going to begin reading in verse 22. Thou that sayest the man should not commit adultery, dost thou commit adultery? Thou that abhorrest idols, dost thou commit sacrilege? Thou that makest thy boast of the law, through breaking the law, dishonorest thou God? For the name of God is blasphemed, among the Gentiles through you, as it is written. For circumcision verily profiteth if thou keep the law. But if thou be a breaker of the law, thy circumcision is made uncircumcision. And I'll stop reading there. In our last study, we were looking in verse 22, and uh, we we saw how God, um, after... Um, making references to to the Jews or or those that are called Jews according to verse 17 and rest in the law and they they make their boast of God they glory in God and they know God's will they approve of the things excellent and they're instructed out of the law and 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 they're confident that they're a guide to the blind and a light to them in darkness they believe they're an instructor of the foolish, a teacher of babes, and then they have the form of knowledge and of the truth in the law. And then uh, the Lord began to ask some pointed questions in verse 21. You who teach another, teachest thou not thyself? You that preachest a man should not steal, dost thou steal? And the answer to that would um relate to the Lord Jesus uh, overturning the table, the money changers, and and saying that um, they, they made God's house, which is a house of prayer, into a den of thieves. So it, in the spiritual realm, uh, according to the gospel, they do steal because they they do not teach the truth and, and uh, the right path the right door to heaven, which is through Christ, the truth of the word of God. But they teach other ways, which is like a, th- uh, a thief and a robber who climbs up another way to enter into the house or into the kingdom of God. And and, and so the, uh, the, the answer to that, to profess Christians and to Jews of old that were not truly saved is, yes, they do. They do steal. Then in verse 22, Thou that sayest the man should not commit adultery, does thou commit adultery? And at the end of our last study, we went to Revelation chapter 2. And I want to turn there again. Revelation 2. And the Lord was addressing the church in um, Thyatira. Verse 18. And then he said he had a few things against them because they suffered uh, that woman Jezebel, in verse 20, which calleth herself a prophetess to teach and to seduce my servants to commit fornication and to eat things sacrificed unto idols. Now, we have to understand that the gospel went forth, and when people said they're a Christian and they went into the church, they were professing marriage to Christ as part of the bride of Christ, because everyone that becomes saved is made part of the bride. Of course, a professed Christian who is Christian only through his profession and called a Christian, yet someone not truly born again, and that is not an actual Christian uh, made by God, they entered into the churches and they said they have a marriage relationship with Christ, and, you know, in marriage you have to be faithful, but then 
when false teachers, emissaries of Satan, began to come into the congregation. They allowed it. They suffered that woman Jezebel. Jezebel, of course, was married to Ahab and died and is long gone. But God is using her as a figure of those that are contrary to the truth and hostile to the true people of God as Jezebel sought to have Elijah slain. And so it's really pointing to people who teach falsely. And here Jezebel, who calls herself a prophetess, um, to teach and to seduce my servants to commit fornication and to eat things sacrificed unto idols. They left their first love. They went away from the truth. And in doing so, they were engaged in spiritual fornication against the law of God and against Christ. When people are not married actually to the Lord Jesus through being born again, they remain married to the law of God. And the law is the word. So really, that's also to Christ in a sense. But uh, then as as they're engaged in um, falsehoods and lies and other kinds of gospels and doctrines, they're committing spiritual fornication and spiritual idolatry. And this is in violation of the law and violation of their professed marriage to Christ. And so God says in verse 21 of Revelation 2, And I gave her space to repent of her fornication, and she repented not. Behold, I will cast her into a bed, and them that commit adultery with her into great tribulation, except they repent of their deeds. And uh, here the Lord is letting it be known. He gave space to the church, the corporate church, to repent. And, of course, the space was almost 2,000 years. It's the whole duration of the church age, 1,955 years of time in which the churches and congregations could have repented. They could have turned to God and, and, and wailed and wept and, and cried out and made correction of their doctrine, but they, they never did. They never did. They, they just continued on with the errors and in their confessions, in their creeds, their high places, which which became idols. And, and so when uh, churches followed the confession and creed over the teaching of the Bible, and they taught the congregation the things of the confessions and the things of the creeds, rather than the things of the Word of God, then they were eating things sacrificed unto idols. And... They, they were feeding the members of the congregation these lies that were basically offerings to idols. And, and God put up with it and put up with it and put up with it until the time came. And then on May 21, 1988, the day before Pentecost, the church age ended and God's wrath came down and judgment began at the house of God and began the great tribulation. So God cast her, the church, the church that suffered Jezebel, cast her into a bed, and them that committed adultery with her into great tribulation. And and that's what took place, and we're beyond that now. But that's how we can understand what we're reading in Romans 2, as the Lord is speaking to the Jew that typifies the Christian. And and he is saying, Thou that sayest a man should not commit adultery, does thou commit adultery? And overall, those in the churches would not outwardly, physically commit adultery. But again and again, they have spiritually committed adultery against the relationship they have with God. And then the Lord says the last part of verse 22, Thou that abhorrest idols... Does thou commit sacrilege? And just made mention of that with the reference in Revelation 2. It also spoke of idols. Now, it's interesting that 
the word sacrilege, which is only found here. It's the only place in the Bible you'll find this word. It's Strong's number 2416. It comes from Strong's number 2417 in the Greek, and that also is only used one time. And it's translated as robbers of churches in Acts 19, verse 37. I'll back up so we get some of the context. Verse 35, when the town clerk had appeased the people, he said, Ye men of Ephesus, what man is there that knoweth not how that the city of the Ephesians is a worshiper of the great goddess Diana and of the image which fell down from Jupiter? Seeing then that these things cannot be spoken against, ye ought to be quiet and to do nothing rashly, for ye have brought hither these men, which are neither robbers of churches, nor yet blasphemers of your goddess. So robbers of churches is this related word to sacrilege. And and robbers of churches is a compound word that is made up of the word temple and rob. And um, the word rob is also used in 2 Corinthians 11.8 concerning uh, the Apostle Paul's statement that he robbed churches. So I'm not completely sure what to make of this, uh, except that God is certainly using it in a negative way in relationship to idols. And if it would follow the previous statements, you that teach another, do you not teach yourself? You that preach, a man should not steal. Do you steal? They're just the opposites. And and uh, um, thou that says a man should not co- commit adultery, do you commit adultery? Thou that abhorrest idols, we would expect, do you, do you commit uh, idolatry? And I, I think it has to carry that kind of meaning, although it's a little hard to see with this word sacrilege, but, but I think that would be the, the meaning. It, it would just follow the pattern. Thou that abhorrest idols, they, um, they hate the idol, the thing that men have made and carved out of a tree and decked with gold and silver and and in the reformed churches oh yeah they they would mock the idea that people have made idols and worship them and not us not us we have certainly learned we have become civilized we have become god's people we are christians we do not worship idols. Of course, there's a big part of the corporate church that has been apostate for many centuries that sets up idols all over the place. Actually, um, there, there are several denominations that do engage in idolatry. Uh, some Orthodox denominations, uh, Russian Orthodox, Greek Orthodox, the Catholic Church, and and others that would say they're Christian still engage in idolatry. They uh, worship saints and Mary and and all kinds of things, and yet they don't they don't see it that way. They don't see it that way. Well, it doesn't matter if they see it or not. God sees it, and, and so He's making this point: You that hate idols, you abhor idols, do you commit idolatry? And of course, on a spiritual level, the Bible tells us covetousness is related to idolatry. And and so the answer for the unsaved professors, you know, Jews in name only, Christians in name only, is yes, they do, because they do the opposite of what God has commanded. Although they think they're upholding the law of God on one point, yet they fail to do so because God's law has depths of meaning. And, and even as far as adultery, remember the Lord Jesus said, whoever has looked upon a woman with lust in his heart has committed adultery already with her in his heart. And so uh, the law of God is designed to make the whole world guilty, to find fault. It's designed to cause a man and a woman 
to see their sin, to see their sinners, and that they cannot get right with God through keeping the law. And it's designed to bring them to the end of the law, which is the Lord Jesus Christ and his righteousness. But many fail to understand that, to really know that, and, you know, they they end up being destroyed while all the while they think that they're servants of God. Okay, in verse 23, Thou that makest thy boast of the law through breaking the law, dishonorest thou God. And there we see, that's the point of all these previous statements. Your boasting of the law. And remember, we saw the word boast back in verse 17, at the end of the verse. Well, I'll read the whole thing. It's short. Behold, thou art called a Jew, and restest in the law, and makest thy boast of God. And it's a good thing to make your boast of God. Glory in God. The word boast is the same as glory. But here, in verse 23, Thou that makest thy boast, or glory, of the law. That's not quite the same. Not quite the same. Through breaking the law, dishonorest thou God. So on one hand, they're, they're upholding the law. They stand with the law. They're, they think their righteousness is according to the law and by and through the law. But then they break the law. They break the law. And, you know, the Bible tells us whoever keeps the whole law yet offends in one point is guilty of all. And so the Lord is indicating that it's just not going to work. It's not going to fool God. It's not going to gain anyone entrance in, into the kingdom of heaven who thinks that they can get there through glorying in the law. This is what the Lord says in Ephesians chapter 2, 8 and 9, For by grace are you saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast or glory. And when people are are glorying in the law, you know, a work is a, a work of the law. The law commands, do this or do that. And when somebody thinks they have done it, that's a work. And if they actually have performed, performed it, it's a good work. And God is saying, well, salvation is not of works, lest it lead to boasting. And this is the problem that the nation of Israel had historically. It's the problem that the church has had historically over the course of the church age. The Apostle Paul was moved by God to write in Philippians chapter 3 concerning his heritage, where he begins in verse 2, Beware of dogs, beware of evil workers, beware of the concision, for we are the circumcision which worship God in the Spirit and rejoice in Christ Jesus and have no confidence in the flesh. Though I might also have confidence in the flesh, if any other man thinketh that he has whereof he might trust in the flesh, I more. Circumcise the eighth day of the stock of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew, the Hebrews, as touching the law of Pharisee, concerning zeal, persecuting the church touching the righteousness which is in the law, blameless. But what things were gained to me, those I counted loss for Christ, yea, doubtless, and I count all things but loss for the excellency of the knowledge of Christ Jesus my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things, and do count them but dung, that I may win Christ, and be found in him, not having mine own righteousness, which is of the law, but that which is through the faith of Christ, the righteousness which is of God by faith. And here the Apostle Paul makes reference to his righteousness in verse 6, touching the righteousness which is in the law, blameless. So he did what the leaders of Israel said you had to do. You have to be circumcised. You, you have to be zealous. And in, in this case, his zealousness 
involved persecuting the church. And whatever they said, he did. And, and he was blameless in those things. And yet, he wasn't saved. He wasn't saved until the Lord Jesus Christ intervened and delivered him from the path he was following, which was a path of trying to get right with God through the keeping of the law of God. And this was not going to bring him to heaven. We can see when we go back to Romans 2, the last part of verse 23, thou that makest thy boast of the law through breaking the law, and and the word breaking is also the translated as transgressing, through transgressing the law, dishonorest thou God. And that word dishonorest is um, a very strong word. Uh, if we go to John chapter 8, in John 8, starting in verse 45, it says, and this is Christ um, who's speaking, and because I tell you the truth, ye believe me not. Which of you convinceth me of sin? And if I say the truth, why do you not believe me? He that is of God heareth God's words. Ye therefore hear them not, because ye are not of God. Then answered the Jews, and said unto him, Say we not well, that thou art a Samaritan, and hast a devil? Jesus answered, I have not a devil, but I honor my father, and ye do dishonor me. Of course they dishonored him. They they terribly dishonored him to say he had a devil, and, and these were the ones who believed in him. They were following him, and and yet they also dishonored him. And so are the people we're reading about in Romans 2, the ones that follow Christ. They profess to be Christians of the family of Christ, of the family of God. And they are completely identified, associated, tied up with the law of God, with all the statements that we've seen so far in this passage. They, they think they have the truth that it's through their teaching and preaching that they're the light that will bring the gospel to those in the darkness. They're the guide of the blind and so forth. They think all these things, and it's not so. It's not true. God is pressing upon them reality, and and he's saying, uh, you, you boast of the law, and yet uh, through the breaking of the law, you dishonor God. And as I said, this word dishonor is, is uh, very strong. It's only used a um, handful of times, really. And we saw one place in John 8, but it's the same word that we read back in Romans chapter 1 in verse 24, where it says, Wherefore God also gave them up to uncleanness through the lusts of their own hearts to dishonor their own bodies between themselves, and it's speaking of all manner of immorality, of sexual immorality, and those acts, physical acts, dishonor God. And, and well, actually there it said they, they dishonored themselves, and, and, and that actually just teaches us how um, grievous a thing it is that here, those that are professed Christians and and uh, you know call themselves Jews, that that the breaking of the law dishonors God. It it brings dishonor to God, and that leads us into verse twenty four. For the name of God is blasphemed among the Gentiles through you, as it is written. The name of God, the name of God identifies with God's person, his, his character, his attributes. Uh, really, all that God is, is involved with his name. And, and, and yet, the name of God is blasphemed among the Gentiles through you. 
through you who call yourselves Jews. And, and uh, you know, uh, there's no doubt that those in the churches would avoid the light shining upon them by, you know, zeroing in on verse 17 statement, thou callest thyself a Jew. Well, God's just speaking to the Jews. Even though at this point he's ended his relationship with Israel, the veil of the temple is rented in twain. Uh, Jerusalem is no longer the holy city. And, and God is is no longer dwelling in them in any kind of a way. But he's established the church. He is using the Jew as a reference to the New Testament Christian churches and congregations. And the fact that through their breaking of his law, their failure to be faithful, to keep his commandments, to uphold the truth of the word of God, to, to proclaim true doctrine and, and the right gospel, that this results in God's name being blasphemed among the nations. And the word blaspheme, which is found, I think, 35 times, it's uh, Strong's 987, used around 35 times in the New Testament. It's translated as speak evil of 10 times. And and that helps me to understand what it, it's really saying, what this word means. It's giving occasion to the enemies of God that are out there in the world when they see the sins, the transgressions of the Christians who have taken the name of God, that because Christ is God, and they call themselves by God's name, and then they abuse it and give occasion to these enemies of God's kingdom to blaspheme God. That's what the Lord is revealing in this verse, and, and it's a very terrible thing that has happened throughout the church age, and especially at the very end of the church age, as we've witnessed it. You've been listening to eBible Fellowship's Evening Bible Studies with your host and Bible teacher, Chris McCann. Visit our website at ebiblefellowship.org for additional studies. Until next time, may the Lord's perfect will be done.